This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online. If you only had one car for the rest of your life, you take really great care of it. Well, we only have one brain in life. Visit betterhelp.com super and take care of one of the most important parts of you, your mind. Today's episode will contain spoilers for Wakanda Forever. Hey, brother! Wakanda Forever, a fantastic cap off to phase four of the MCU and has me more excited than ever for what the future might hold. But as ever, ending a phase has brought us more questions than answers. Like, uh, hey, Churi didn't show up there at the end at Warrior Falls. Does that just mean that like M'Baku is like the new king of Wakanda? And also, does that mean that he's gonna be like a second Black Panther? And speaking of kings, what about Namor? Is he a king or a god? And I'm talking like capital G god, like Thor. I am the god of thunder! Actually, is Thor even a capital G god? There's only one god, man. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. Cap is going to be in for a surprise if he ever sees this place. Okay, but either way, Namor is obviously like insanely powerful and one way or another, he does seem to be some version of immortal. Or at the very least, he's been gifted with like extreme longevity given that he's like centuries old. So maybe he's like lowercase i immortal. But so if Namor is lowercase i immortal and the heart-shaped herb that Shuri took had some of his herb, does that mean that Shuri is immortal now too? Also, what are Namor's powers in the first place? Or more importantly, where did they come from? Is he a mutant or a god? Or is it all coming from the herbs? All of the above, some of the above. Oh, and then also, can we just talk about this completely out of left field? Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, AKA Val, shows up in this movie and is randomly formerly married to Everett Ross. Like. What? What are the implications of that? Honestly, there is just so much to talk about. So today we are going to be diving into our top unanswered questions from Wakanda Forever. Let's do it. All right, let's not waste any time at all and just dive on into question number one. Is M'Baku now the official king of Wakanda? And if he is, does that mean he will also consume the heart-shaped herb and be like a second Black Panther after Shuri? We know that after T'Challa's death, his mother, Ramonda, is instated as queen. After what I can only imagine was like a total death match over at Warrior Falls. Like, did you see this woman in this movie? She is completely ripped. Let's all just take a minute to admire Angela Bassett for what she did in this movie because I, like, at times I was legitimately like, how did they find a real queen who was willing to be in the movie? I'm just a big fan, that's all I'm saying. Anyway, the point is though, we of course know that she does die during the events of the film and it leaves this big open question as to who will be the new ruler of Wakanda. The obvious and only line of succession that we know of you know, at the time is of course Shuri. And soon after her mother mother's death, she does, like the two kings before her, her brother and her father, don the mantle of the Black Panther. Now, to be fair, T'Challa was already the Black Panther while his father was still alive, but it also seems like these two roles are absolutely intertwined. And yet, despite taking up the mantle herself, at the end of the movie, she does not show up at Warrior Falls, which I can't say I am completely surprised about given how she felt towards the ceremony during Black Panther 1. This corset is really uncomfortable. So could we all just wrap it up and go home? But what was a surprise is the fact that when the jet pulls up, M'Baku is the person who steps out and announces that Shuri is not going to be there and that he would once again like to challenge for the throne. So to me, this does mean, yes, M'Baku basically was coming to challenge Shuri, who was just, of course, not there to accept the challenge in the first place and would just therefore win by default. And I think given the fact that he's the one stepping out of the jet, probably means that him and Shuri like planned this in advance, unlike last time where he sort of caught everybody off guard. Now, I guess to be fair, it is entirely possible that someone else could have stepped forward and then challenged M'Baku, but I sort of doubt it. I don't know if you guys were watching how he devoured that carrot, but uh, you know, I wouldn't want to go up against him. One more word and I will feed you to my children. I'm kidding, we are vegetarians. On the other hand though, on the question as to whether or not he becomes a Black Panther in addition to Shuri, or possibly even more simply, 
instead of Shuri? I think the answer is probably not. We know that T'Challa did hold both the mantle of King and Black Panther, as well as his father before him at one time. But the way that I think it works is that the ruler of Wakanda has the right to determine who holds the mantle of the Black Panther. It can be themselves, or someone else. But otherwise, still traditionally, only one person does hold that position, and I have a feeling Shuri is not going to let it go, and given the fact that she almost certainly arranged this situation with M'Baku in the first place, I have a feeling he will be king and she will be Black Panther. Now, the interesting thing about how this affects the future of Wakanda is the fact that the reason Shuri is missing this particular ceremony is because she is going to meet up with Nakia, who has a bit of a surprise reveal in the form of Shuri's nephew, aka a the prince of Wakanda. Given that Umbaku just became king and now T'Challa has a son who goes by his same name, it does present a certain opportunity way down the line for there to be some like unusual claims to the throne. But speaking of young T'Challa, that also does bring up an interesting question just about him at all. Like, what is his deal or does he even have one in the first place? Mostly, I just think that this is another clever way that the writers were honoring the late Chadwick Boseman. He is otherwise fairly unique in that there is no like comic book counterpart, which is fairly unusual for the MCU at large. The only time in the comics where T'Challa ever has a son is in an alternate universe where it's actually with Storm from the X-Men. And obviously in this case, Storm is not the mother, unless Nakia is about to have some serious upgrades headed her way. I can't say that I can't see it, but I might still doubt it. This means that young T'Challa could be a huge question mark as we move forth in the MCU, especially just given the fact that every other movie lately seems to have introduced another younger Avenger level character. The other thing that I do find interesting about T'Challa's son though, is the fact that he is specifically six years old, which means that he was born pre-snap and specifically not snapped. So just as a general fun fact, when you see T'Challa in Infinity War and Endgame, he already has a son. But guys, we need to take a quick pause right there to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Stamps.com. Guys, I just have one simple question for you today. What are you doing? It's holiday season, you should be preparing. I'm just kidding, of course. I'm just so glad that you're here watching with us. But seriously, it is that time of year where holiday prep chaos is in full force, especially if you're a small business. And if you're like me and you're already busy with shopping and baking and wrapping, then the last thing in the world you wanna do is slay yourself down to the post office every day. Luckily though, it is not too late to get your holiday shipping and mailing under control with stamps.com. It's so easy that if you sign up right now, you will be printing your own postage with within minutes. Seriously, stamps.com is a stress-free decision for every small business. All you need is a computer and a printer and you can start printing postage no matter where you are. You can also get package pickup through their dashboard. And if you're running an online store, stamps.com works seamlessly with every single shopping cart and marketplace. You guys know that rates are constantly changing and it's so hard to know whether or not you're getting the best deal. But with their switch and save feature, you can easily change between carriers to make sure you're always getting the best rates. Plus you can sign up with the promo code SuperCarlin for a special offer that includes a four week trial, free postage, and a free digital scale. There are no long term commitments or contracts. All you have to do is go to stamps.com, click the little microphone in the corner, and enter promo code SuperCarlin. Again, it's going to be stamps.com, promo code SuperCarlin. Link is in the description down below. But from there, let's move on to our next unanswered question, which has to do with Namor, his powers, and where they came from. Most of the characters in the MCU just get an entire movie dedicated to the very question of, where did you get your powers from? And typically then, it's an entire movie to explain it to you, and usually just the one source, like a radioactive spider, if you will. You got bit by a spider? Can it bite me? Not like, you know, the radioactive spider that bit me at the same time that the Tesseract was exploding at the same time that Odin was over in the corner whispering to the Norse mighty spandex suit of thunder. But all of this is the case with Namor, who potentially has three different sources of power, all of which are explained to us in rapid succession in a flashback. Basically, his mother's tribe was infected with smallpox from Spanish colonizers. The leader of this tribe was led by their god, Kukul Khan, which 
I know I'm pronouncing wrong, to their version of the heart-shaped herb, which is a special plant that grows in vibranium-rich soil. And upon consuming this particular plant, their physiology changes completely and they actually have to go live underwater in order to breathe. And while his mom is pregnant with him, the unborn Namor is selected by Kuko Khan to be their leader once he is born. He then has extra powers the rest of his people don't, including increased longevity, winged feet, super strength, and the ability to breathe above water. All of that said, he also tells Shuri, the plant gave me wings on my ankles and ears that point into the clouds. I was a mutant. I could swim in the sky and age slower. Breathe air, our ancestors breathe. Okay, so he says that it's the plant that gave him his mutations. That's pretty interesting when you consider the fact that T'Challa's son was born under very similar circumstances. Except in his case, it would be his father, not his mother, who had already consumed like the vibranium enriched plant, which is I don't know, fascinating to consider. Either way though, back to Namor. It sounds like that is like the primary source of his powers, except there's also this question as to whether or not like their God selected him to become a mutant. This could explain how he has existed as a mutant for hundreds of years while there haven't been any other discovered mutants, although all of a sudden they do seem to be popping up everywhere, which makes me wonder what would have caused like all of the other mutants to just all of a sudden burst into existence. Like, you know, something that could have activated their X gene. Also Disney bot Fox. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, if the Eternals has taught us anything, it's that the snaps had way more implications than just simply the blip and some unusual age-related math. If it was enough to cause the emergence of a celestial living at the core of our planet, I have a feeling it was also potentially enough to, you know, trigger some latent X genes. That's the gene that usually creates most mutants and also why we refer to them as the X-Men. But again, back to Namor, I also think that it is worth pointing out that he is not actually a god in the same way that like Thor is. Noob master, hey, it's Thor again. You know, the god of thunder? Like he couldn't be invited to omnipotent city to engage in the whatever group activities are going on there. And the reason I feel fairly confident about this is because within Omnipotent City itself, I think that we can actually see the god that Namor is based off of. You can actually spot the real Kukul Khan right here. And like Namor in full headdress looks like this is the person that he is attempting to emulate, but the real guy is in the city of the gods and even has the blue skin to match. Heck, he's even sitting next to Bast, the panther god from Black Panther. Like that can't be a mistake. On that note, another question you might potentially have is why some of the Talokan people seem to be blue while others did not. This actually tripped me up a little bit while I was watching the movie and the answer is, they're all blue. It just depends on whether or not they are above or below water. If they're above water, they're blue. If they're not, they're not. Okay, so that hopefully explains Namor's powers, but what about Shuri? Like, is she also potentially immortal now? Because she consumed some of the same herb as Namor did. And the answer is, I don't think so. What Shuri's trying to do throughout the movie is synthetically recreate the properties of the heart-shaped herb in order to save T'Challa. And her inability to do so ends up being a massive source of survivor's guilt, as if it's her fault that he died because she wasn't able to invent a cure, which is just really sad and makes me want to give her a big hug. Either way though, what makes this particularly interesting is that what ultimately makes her successful in recreating the herb is a fragment of the plant that Namor's people use that gave them their powers. She was basically able to combine that data with the structure of her brother's DNA and then, you know, like cross multiply and divide, solve for superpowers. But the important thing about Namor's herb is that it was vibranium enriched, not that it gave her the same powers as the Talokans, otherwise she would have to probably go and live underwater. And again, Namor's powers are sourced from being a mutant, not actually from consuming this same particular herb, because as a reminder, he never consumed it himself. His mother did while she was pregnant with him. But what Shuri was specifically working towards is recreating the heart-shaped herb. And that is what she did. And therefore the power sourced from that heart-shaped herb mimic the powers from the real heart-shaped herb, not Namor's plan. Moving on from that though, we'll move on to a question that might feel like it's coming from out of left field, but that's kind of fitting considering that's how this character felt inside of this movie. I'm speaking of course of Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, AKA the 
ex-wife of Everett Ross, apparently. This will be the third time that we've seen her make an appearance in the MCU, with the first being in Black Widow, the second being in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and now finally in Wakanda Forever. Each time that she appears, she seems to be recruiting somebody for some version of a team that she's putting together. And given the fact that in Wakanda Forever, she specifically says that she's like dreamt of a world where America has specific control over vibranium, I have a feeling is going to have a pretty nefarious purpose. We do know what the team she is forming is called. It will eventually be regarded as the Thunderbolts and so far includes the following members. Yelena from Black Widow, Winter Soldier, Red Guardian, US Agent, Taskmaster, and Ghost. What's fascinating about how much we're seeing about the Thunderbolts right now is that this movie is intended to be the final movie in phase five of the MCU and they are already building a huge amount of mystery around it really far in advance. I mean, for one, we've just now learned that she was married to Everett Ross, which is kind of fascinating given the fact that there is another character in the MCU, Thaddeus Ross, who is also known as Thunderbolt Ross. So far, there's been no familial connection tied between Thaddeus and Everett Ross, although it seems possible that there could be given that they're both in the CIA. We do know that Thaddeus Ross typically ends up being Red Hulk, who is a very notable member of the Thunderbolts from the comics. We also know that the character of Thaddeus Ross has been recast by Harrison Ford in the wake of William Hurt's death. And, and and is supposed to appear in the next upcoming Captain America movie, New World Order. The question though is whether or not he'll be working with Val, for Val, against Val? Who knows? If we wanna add just a little extra confusion to the mix, we also have the fact that Okoye in her new midnight armor also saves Everett Ross at the end of Wakanda Forever. So I have to imagine that's for some other team based reason. On top of on top of that confusion, we also have the fact that Baron Zemo was just reintroduced to the MCU in Falcon and the Winter Soldier and is typically the founding member of the Thunderbolts. And as long as we're piling on, we may as well also point out the fact that in Thor Love and Thunder, they steal Zeus's lightning bolt, which is named Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt! What is going on with this group of people? I am so confused. By the way, I have a feeling phase five, gonna be a lot of fun. But either way, guys, those were our top questions walking out of Wakanda Forever. Hopefully it cleared something up for you. But if you have any other questions for us about the movie or the MCU at large, be sure to let us know in the towel section down below. Otherwise, guys, as always, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you'd like to see our complete spoiler review of Wakanda Forever, you can do so right over here. But otherwise, until next time, bye.